Ten years ago, reformers in and outside of government launched the Open Government Partnership, a new way to make governments more transparent, participatory, inclusive, and accountable. Our 10th anniversary Global Summit brings our community together to redouble our efforts to renew democracy. And for the entire Global Summit program, you can visit ogpsummit.org. My name is Jennifer Clyde, and welcome to the Civic Space and Public Participation Plenary, Beyond the Ballot Box, Building Inclusive Civic Space. Live interpretation will be provided in English, French, Korean, and Spanish. So please click the globe button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and choose the applicable language. Thank you for joining us today for this important conversation. In the wake of 15 years of declining democracy trends, we will discuss ideas for protecting and expanding civic space, deepening participation of communities and policy innovations being progressed in OGP countries. We will also celebrate the reformers behind them, some who continue working in very challenging contexts. We will have a few different segments today, starting with a fireside chat followed by two panel discussions. We encourage you to get involved in the conversation by posting questions in the chat. You can also post online using the hashtag OGP Summit. To open the plenary, we will now go to a fireside chat with our first speakers. Samantha Power, Administrator for the United States Agency for International Development, in conversation with Aruna Roy, founder of the Mazdur Kisan Shakti Sangathan and leading Indian civil society activist. Administrator Power and Aruna Roy were among the founders of OGP. Next, Aidan Eyakuze, executive director of Twazewa, Twaweza, East Africa and incoming OGP Civil Society co-chair will be moderating the discussion. Executive Director, the floor is yours. Good morning. Hello. To you, Ambassador Samantha Power. Good evening to you, Aruna, and good afternoon to everybody else from a very sunny Dar es Salaam. I know it's very early there, Ambassador Power, and it's getting late-ish for you, Aruna, so let's have a a fun fireside chat, and I'm really looking forward to learning from you, being inspired by you, learning a bit of history lessons of what uh, got you to start the OGP, and then to get some ideas on how we really take this thing forward. You'll see in the back of me, uh, there are some Kiswahili words in the banner behind me saying, democracy yetu. That means our democracy. And I really want us to have this conversation. <clears throat> about that. So let me start by asking you respectfully, if in the spirit of a fireside chat, I may refer to you as Aruna and Samantha. Is that okay? And it's fine. Of course. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you so much. So um, public participation and civic space are at the core of, open, of the Open Government Declaration, which was adopted 10 years ago. Huh? And by the founding 17, I'll call them the founding 17, eight governments, nine civil society leaders. And you too were part of those founding 17. So let me ask you this first question. What were your most important ambitions for public participation and civic space a decade ago? 10 years later, what are you most proud of uh, having achieved uh, in this space? Let me start, let's start with Aruna uh, for you first, and then I'll come back to you, uh, Samantha. Uh, I'm so glad I am with Samantha because I think many a decade ago we met in the USA and I think people like you contributed a lot. You were in government then, you are in government again and you I think have negotiated the difficult task of extending the boundaries of government by being vocal and committed to issues of open government. I'm really glad you're here that so that with you and I there will be two parts of the story. The Initiators of OGP, in a way, also convinced people who were slightly skeptical, like me, in the steering committee, uh, that there was an important role that we could all play together. Because still the OGP, uh, actually we were on two sides of the fence, the government on one side and civil society on the other. 
So we were really happy to come together to uh, work together. And it was, um, it's very rarely that you get uh, an opportunity like this one to be part of a historical process and yet comment on what has happened. But I think singularly, the singular achievement of the OGP for me is A, the exponential growth that it's, that it's had, but also the fact that it was much more than just uh, uh, a, a civil society and, and a government coming together, but it was coming together with equality. Uh, mm -hmm. And equality, not only in the nature of participation in speaking, but in terms of processes, deliberative processes, and in the number of equal number of co-chairs, and every meeting we had, there was equal representation of civil society and of, uh, of the governments. And the synergetic co coalitions that we actually dreamed of came to be, but it also set very practical standards for right to know free speech, freedom of expression, right. and it demystified government for many of us because we didn't know what was going on behind the walls of secrecy. It broke the wall or it withdrew the curtain of secrecy and many things came to be. Uh, it opened new possibilities uh, in multilateral efforts, in the international coalitions, in global solidarities, and in our engagement with structures of power. We learned how to deal with power, both domestically and internationally. And now as we face pushback, repression and restrictions in trans transitional democracies, we know how much we have achieved. I would say that OGP popularized information sharing and open government as a necessary part of the framework of governance and has made citizen participation a systemic reality. Uh, I think let we me, don't have to lead our case any further. <laughs> yes, let me invite uh, Samantha uh, to also reflect. What, what are you most proud of? I recall five years ago, we were in Paris together at the Paris uh, summit, and you have to say were quite despondent because it was after the election results were out, right? You were quite despondent. But if you look over the 10 year space, what is it that you're most proud of with respect to protecting civic space or advancing a public participation in the OGP space? Um, well, I, I think first of all, in Paris, I was not the only one who was despondent <laughs> last I checked. Um, uh, but I, I'd like to, I mean, I think it's important to go back actually to, to the precipitant uh, for what happened um, in the in the coming together that Aruna has talked about, uh, I, I was very influenced by a young staffer on the National Security Council named Jeremy Weinstein, who some of you know. And uh, Jeremy and I went to President Obama, and like so many people uh, in democracies at the time, we went with all the horrifying statistics about the extent to which civil society was being. Uh, cramped or a civic space, as somebody put it last week at Biden's Democracy Summit, was not being reduced but eliminated. Um, and so all those NGO laws that are now way worse uh, 10 years later, unfortunately, uh, the, 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 as, we, as we put it at the time, the bad guys are learning from each other. What, what, what can we do to uh, use the convening power that the U.S. has uh, potentially to uh, create resources and a network and enhance the network that's already existing, of course, in more informal ways to ensure that the, the, the good people like Aruna out there on the front lines um, have a hook to engage governments that are maybe moving in the wrong direction or have a hook to engage other civil society warriors um, and other government reformers uh, in other parts of the world. So that was the idea. It was a, a defensive uh, I think precipitant in one respect, but it was offensive in that I personally, as somebody who was not by any means an expert on right to information, was completely inspired by the RTI movement, specifically in India. And I do want to call it out a little bit because I think that um, there were many at the beginning of OGP who thought of this as kind of techie, modern, you know, what are the new tech tools that can be brought to bear? And what's so inspiring and informative about the RTI movement there and then how that has, uh, I, I do think, uh, inspired so many around the world is it shows, the, as Aruna just said, the power of information per se. And that, you know, uh, when you take information from filing cabinets uh, that are gathering dust and manila folders 
and get that information out to the people. And that's what the, you know, you all know the images of, of people actually writing the information up on schoolhouse walls or, or factory walls. And then you see somebody coming and saying, wait, it says that information from the center says that I'm supposed to have been paid X amount for this roadworks project. I didn't get paid that amount or wait, so-and-so he died. <laughs> what the hell's his name doing up there? You know? And for me, that was like, it was, it was a revelation, right? About information as not leveling the playing field. We can't kid ourselves, but, but giving people who are, 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 are too often left behind and left without a voice, this, this tool, this power. And so, so the, the first meeting that we had in Washington that Aruna referenced, uh, we had nine governments at the time. We won't say who the, the ninth was, who, who didn't make it across the, the starting line. Um, but, uh, but, and then we had our civil society partners. So it was meant to be symmetrical, in fact. The, the uh, idea that governments could not play unless and until they developed their national action plans with civil society at the table was very controversial you know it was sort of like can we would governments do it i mean who would join you know i'm i'm, I'm thinking as a government official like who who are we going to get i mean i mean how are we going to go to countries they're going to say wait i'm i'm trying to eliminate civil society not develop a national action plan with with civil society anyway so and so that was, the 78 was, of them would join you know so yeah <laughs> so so what seems obvious now i just want to bring us because what seems obvious now and we were influenced by uh the extractive uh transparency initiative and so forth like we, we there were other models out there that were already well ahead of us what we were doing but but the launch was one thing and i i count count myself a little bit of a call me a numerical skeptic like over the years I, I, I would hear the kind of X number of countries have joined or X number of cities. But when you ask me, what am I most proud of? It's, it's less that, I mean, I'm thrilled like to see this in Korea. I can't even imagine 10 years later, I'm thrilled that it, uh, you know, didn't miss a beat when the United States receded in the way that we did over the last four years. That's a real tribute to, right. When you build institutions that are not dependent on, some random group of people sitting around a table, it gets into the bloodstream of the, of the international system. I'm proud of all that, but the main thing I'm proud of is the way that uh, reformers inside and outside of government have in fact learned from one another on beneficial ownership, on RTI, on uh, open procurement. And let me say one last thing, and sorry to hog the floor here when we have the great Aruna with us, but as a now running USAID, I've traveled uh, in recent days to Moldova, to the Dominican Republic. I've had, you know, very, I think, uh, important opening conversations with, for example, the president of Zambia. These are three countries that have now leadership that is uh, dedicated to reform. They ran on, on anti-corruption platforms, on reformist platforms. And for me to be able to say, okay, there's, USAID and US government and the Department of Treasury and what can we do? But the most thrilling thing for me is to say there's this thing called the Open Government Partnership. And they have this thing called a technical support unit. And they have within that technical support unit people who have been to other countries that have tried and maybe failed what you're trying or tried and learned in these ways. And it's not to say there's one size fits all, everything has to be custom to you. But take it away, OGP. Uh, that is that is a remarkable uh, feature of that, and that's really because I think civil society grabbed this and ran with it. It's fantastic, Ambassador, because I think you echo what uh, Sanjay was saying about the mechanism really being set up in an institution to help this partnership really work well. Let's talk a little bit more about public participation. And Aruna, if I might bring you really to the present, to last month where the farmers got three agricultural bills in India repealed, which they were protesting against uh, for a whole year. Isn't that exciting for you to see how public participation is actually shaping public policy in India? And what can we learn in other countries from that fantastic experience of that farmers' protest to change the laws in, in India? You know, this transactional democracies can move both ways. Sometimes they move forward and sometimes they move backwards. And unfortunately in India, we now have a built-in resistance to uh, information sharing and accountability. And actually the farmers laws should not have been passed in parliament the way they were. 
but it was remarkable that for one year, I think the largest movement probably in the last few decades in the world, millions of people just squatted on roads, radial roads leading into Delhi and with a very reluctant government and a government not willing to share, uh, they just with totally in a non-violent way and with absolute technical perfection, knowing exactly what they wanted and where the laws were wrong and getting women in such large numbers, peasant women, farmers, children, writers, poets, people who created songs, the whole of India actually participated in that. And it was an amazing thing. And we are so happy that they have won this battle because in winning this battle, they have won many things. They have won on transparency, they have won on accountability, they have won on people's participation in policymaking with which our right to information law actually began uh, in the early decades of, the, of this uh, millennia. They have also won the right, the obligation for a government to run through its parliamentary processes carefully because you cannot have an ordinance passed with a few minutes on something that's going to impact the entire country. So it was an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary uh, win for all of us. And it's come at a time when we've been fairly dejected because we've been looking at suppression of democratic rights. We've been looking at uh, inequality coming out in terms of denial of citizenship to certain parts of the community uh, in, the, in the country. So actually it has been Fantastic. And that's why we feel that people's movements are really the most important thing. But if I might just deviate a bit and talk about yeah. the technology yeah. bogey, if I may, <laughs> the technology bogey has come to India. And where we were, we dreamt of technology, opening up windows and doors for people, technology actually closed windows and doors and brought in surveillance. Now it became extremely important for movements like us to fight for uh, digital controls. And we had to learn all this, so many things that to be learned by so many people. But what uh, MKSS and the uh, associated movements in Rajasthan have been able to do is to work with government in real partnership, get hold of the digital dialogues, make sure that they passed a law called the Jan Suchna portal and a portal which you will be amazed to know deals with information of 115 government departments and it's put it proactively on the net. So you have a portal with no admin. So anybody can go in, anybody can access that information. And section four of the RTI, which was so motor disclosure or public disclosure was really suffering. We have got this format in place and we have had in the last two years, 100 billion visits to the site and we have had 50 million downloads. It's been an amazing success now. Another government in India called Karnataka government is also doing this. So we are now trying to use digital controls with the people, but we are not succeeding fully. There's still issues on which we are fighting against surveillance, against uh, uh, against attacks on young people who are using social media and so on. Right. That's, maybe you can move on to, on, on that same note about the weaponization of digital. Um, Samantha, there is an allure. The narrative that authoritarians get things done can be very alluring, right? So how do we respond as a movement, as a partnership, to people's frustrations, frankly, with democracy? Uh, and an apparent inefficiency in delivering public goods. How do you galvanize global political leadership, especially to fight that narrative that authoritarians get things done? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I would note uh, an article in yesterday's New York Times uh, talking about the challenge that inflation is posing so many governments, but in particular, uh, the illiberal, some of the illiberal forces who rode, swept to power you know, uh, trying to widen social cleavages and, and cultural cleavages, but claiming that they got things done. And now, uh, you know, in, in, in parts of the world, uh, some of which where elections actually are, are on the verge of happening, where people are like, wait, my check is worth uh, a quarter of what it was worth or a half of what it was worth a year ago. What do you mean you get things done? So 
So the facts do have a funny way of, um, of sneaking up on all governments, irrespective um, of uh, the, the extent to which they use media tools or misinformation um, uh, to, to mislead folks. I guess um, this was a, a kind of creed de corps that I offered in my, the last time I had a chance to engage in OGP summit, as you say, in Paris. And it really was, um, particularly having seen what happened in the US election, the, the extent to which um, illiberal actors swoop in and, and, and sort of create the impression of a correlation between strength uh, and uh, disrespect for institutions and checks and balances and delivery. And I, I, I come back to that, the, the, the founding of OGP and what was so what, what I was so inspired by by uh, the people who work uh, every day in this space, which was the use of information and openness, very specifically to strengthen social service accountability, and and that was you know to see again the way in which when people had information they could tell whether the school textbooks had been bought when as we've seen now through the effectiveness of, of some of the reforms that OGP has helped popularize, when you have public procurement, we just saw this in Ukraine in a program that USAID has funded, the ProZoro program, working with OGP, you know, when, when procurement is, is, is up online, when, when people actually see what you are paying for something, the way that enhances uh, competition and actually saves the government resources, that money then has been pumped back into the Ukrainian state treasury and used to purchase COVID-19 response materials. Um, so, so, but, but is this being publicized? Do people see the link between civic empowerment? You know, there's not always uh, the feedback loop that you all were just talking about as occurred in India, where citizens get to see the reward of their efforts or the reward of their activation. And so I think drawing this link between exercising your rights, using your voice, um, putting pressure on government actors or, or working in partnership with government reformers and enhanced delivery on the ground. That certainly is the approach that I've brought to USAID. Um, and, you know, we in the, in the I don't want to, I mean, we've had tried different things in the past, uh, obviously as, as democracy has been on its back heel, there's been a lot of experimentation going on in a lot of governments, but the approach that, that I am bringing is to say, okay, if you have a reformist opening in a country, first of all, as I mentioned earlier, tell the leader about OGP, let's bring all hands on deck, let's draw from all of the insight from all the cities and all the states that have attempted analogous reforms, that's important. But as I, as I the head of USAID, I can meet that reformist opening by offering more support, you know, very narrowly or specifically in the area, for example, of election reform or something narrowly within the democracy space. But the best thing I can do for a reformer is try to get my colleagues, for example, at the Department of Commerce or the USTR or my counterparts in the private sector to take note of the fact that this opening is occurring in the Dominican Republic that you have a leader who is fighting corruption. I'm the vice chair of the Development Finance Corporation, the old OPIC. One of the most important things I can do that people are excited to get more USAID grants, but they're really excited to get the Development Finance Corporation to show up. And on infrastructure, uh, you know, on, on, on transportation, getting vaccines, uh, you know, not only to a country, but out in, uh, into the health systems of a country, partnering with countries to do that to show that democracy delivers. That is the best antidote to the authoritarians. The corruption is the, we know is the Achilles heel of the, of the illiberal forces that are out there. And this partnership is thus, the open government partnership is thus a tool uh, to fight those illiberal forces by seeking to open up the books. That's, that's only gonna show the extent to which dictators and, and, and illiberal forces get things done for themselves. So that's part of this and USAID of course funds a lot of anti-corruption actors. We've just created a new defamation insurance fund because oligarchs and illiberal forces are increasingly suing civil society organizations and journalists. So we have to protect the accountability frontline uh, using the tools that we have. But beyond that, when there is a reformist moment, can we actually 
bring in not only more support for NGOs or more support for democracy institutions per se, but actually something that will show the people that this is a better path for bread and butter issues as well. That's a great point you make. Democracy delivers. Um, a nice, uh, powerful um, statement. I want to just maybe for, for everybody's benefit um, announce sort of the launching of the OGP Civic Space Learning Network, really to, um, to bring together members of the OGP family to do a very simple mission, to stop and reverse the declining civic space. Simple, but tough to do. And we'll be asking the uh, network to lead by example governments in terms of expanding civic space, to advance reforms that open and protect civic space, and of course, to do global advocacy uh, on opening up civic space. So we want to inspire, teach, and support each other. And for the last minute for each of you, and maybe starting with you, um, Samantha, how can we really mobilize a global, broader global movement for democracy and even more specifically for civic space? Who do we need to talk to and bring them uh, on board? And same question for you, Aruna, to end. Um, are you still a skeptic uh, when you look forward? How can we really um, strengthen a global movement to expand civic space uh, in the way that, that will make it work? We'll start with you, Ambassador, uh, Samantha. Thank you so much. I, I'll just say in brief that, um, I think that the networking is happening. This is the, the rare eight area where we still like technology, Aruna. <laughs> we, we, we like technology because of the, uh, the enhanced platform. It provides uh, people like the civil society uh, actors who are involved in this. But we just need to lift up more uh, success stories. I think the demoralization of civil society in the face of these powerful repressive trends uh, is a gift to the liberal forces. So the flip of that is, what is the positive feedback loop? And, and that's what OGP does. It gathers the best examples, it shares them, but that fuel in the tank, all of us need, whether inside government or outside, to believe we can do this. And so, so I think that again, when you have a reformist opening, whether at the city level, the county level, or at, at, at the head of state level, let us swoop in and offer the support that we can, the, 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 and let us prevent reformers from thinking that just because they swept to power with the help of civil society, uh, that doesn't mean that they're done with civil society, right? Civil society, uh, it, its role becomes all the more important uh, you know, when a reformer actually has, has uh, the opportunity to govern. We need some success stories. We need proof points that the march of the illiberal forces is halted and beginning its decline and reverse. Aruna, give us some inspiring words. You were a skeptic at the beginning. I hope you're not anymore. What's your inspiration for the next decade? Oh, of certainly OGP not. I stopped being a skeptic one month into the OGP. Uh, oh, I just brilliant. began with skepticism. But let me tell you, we need more uh, interaction internationally. Because after all things that happen, for instance, now because of the technology, it travels so quickly. So with Black Lives Matter, what happened evoked so much response in India uh, from Dalits and people who are at the, at, the, at the receiving end of the law. I mean, you know, you really have quick interactions and solidarities being built across, across civil society groups far, far away. And mm. the, the attack on all of us is to stop us from questioning. And information is all about asking. So all about asking, which is questioning. So the attack on questioning is also universal. And all these elected oligarchies that we've got now all over the, all over the world are using uh, our, our votes, but not giving us our rights. So there is a huge discrepancy between getting our votes and giving us our rights. And this dialectic has somehow come to be an international dialectic, a universal global dialectic. So I think more than ever before, we need to get together, we need to exchange. And the amazing thing about information is that in India, despite the effort of our present government to play down RTI, we are still six to eight million users every year. They have not been able to get down the numbers. And actually OGP in uh, promoting civil society participation has really uh, brought in a broad-based education. But I think we need to go a little further than that and talk about specific political education wherever we go, wherever we go, even about the OGP to the younger generation. And I think, of course, I won't take too much time, 
but we must build solidarities again across governments and civil society participants. And we cannot forget that we are obliged to talk truth to power. That as, civil, as a civil society activist, as you can see, I'm no longer so young, but till I have breath in me, it will have to be that I talk truth to power, come what may. And that I think is probably the civil society's greatest contribution to OGP and of course to uh, the debate and discourse all over the world. And I think that should continue. And a responsive government and a responsive system of course makes wonderful things happen. Thank you so much, Aruna. That's so inspiring. Um, speak truth to power. Uh, you're even uh, channeling, I suppose, the Slovak prime minister who said never give up. And Samantha for telling us that democracy delivers certainly a mantra. I look forward to promoting uh, during my co-chair year, which starts uh, soon. Um, and thank you both so much for inspiring us, for informing us for telling us a little bit of the uh, origin story of OGP. Uh, and we really look forward to building this movement to build back better, build better democracy, and to make sure that citizens' voices actually shape better outcomes for themselves. Have a fantastic morning in, uh, in the US and a nice cup of chai for you, Aruna. And I hand it back <laughs> over to the MC. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Samantha. Brilliant. Thank you, Aydan. Thank both sides to both of you. Bye-bye. Meet -bye. Bye -bye. you all Bye -bye. soon, but not virtually, but really. Indeed. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. So thanks again to Aruna Roy, Samantha Power, and Aidan Ayakuze. Next, I would like to introduce the next, the following panel that will give a perspective of the larger environment where civic space operates and how reformers protect our freedoms of expression, assembly, and association. And our speakers are Pang Chong Kyun, Senior Secretary to the President for Civil and Social Agenda, Darren Walker, who is the President of Ford Foundation, a private American foundation that seeks to reduce poverty and injustice, strengthen democratic values, and promote international cooperation and advance human achievement. Also, we have Isabel Ereguerena, co-director of Equis Justicia para las Mujeres, a feminist organization based in Mexico that seeks to transform institutions, laws, and public policies to improve access to justice for all women. And Jeffrey Schlegenhoff, who is the Deputy Secretary General of the OECD. And last but not least, we have Lisa John, Secretary General of Civicus and OGP Steering Committee member, who will be our moderator. Uh, well, the floor is now yours. Yes, we are connected. Hello and welcome. A very warm welcome to the second part of uh, the OGP plenary. Uh, this is the closing plenary where we are going to focus very much on building inclusive civil society and I have the privilege to speak to you from South Africa and be joined by four very distinguished uh, you know, panel members who have already been introduced. So I'm, I'm going to move quickly on because uh, the, the, the essence of this part of the interaction really is on unpacking the opportunities for innovation, leadership and collaboration. And, and really looking at how many of the lessons and models we've developed through the Open Government Partnership Network can really be expanded to build and protect civil society and civic space uh, much further in the coming years. So I'm, I'm going to move to uh, you, Mr. Beng Jun Kwan, uh, first. And uh, I, I, we would love to know more about uh, the, the way that the Moon administration has really engaged with expanding space for civil society in, in the Republic of Korea, and, and also your own thoughts on what more can be done in establishing the collaboration between government and civil society, and the lessons we can really take forward in doing that better in other regions. Thank you very much for the question. The Korean government is maybe the only government that has become an advanced country uh, among the 
the countries that have experienced colonialism and we have not only become an advanced democracy but also we are uh, serving as a global leader of course our democracy was threatened and was put at risk in the past but civil society was strong enough to resist that and was able to nurture democracy during the moon jae-in government we believe that civil society and government have to work together to come up with better policies. And we have put in place uh, various governance frameworks. For instance, we have the Open Policy Communication Forum and uh, Citizen Participation Living Lab and uh, Public Participatory Budget System. So these are some of the examples where uh, citizens can participate in the decision-making process. And also we have the Petition Act, which allows uh, public participation in government policy planning and decision making, and this is guaranteed by law. Furthermore, the government has recognized the importance of providing public data to citizens so that the citizens are able to be better informed of what is happening at the government. As you may know, uh, Korea is a um, chair of the OGP and is a member of the OGP. And uh, we believe in the value of the OGP in facilitating public participation, uh, public participation and uh, we will continue to span our six cases abroad. Thank you so much. And, and I love that you've re reinforced the importance of legislation in, in protecting civic space and civic freedoms. That was something we also heard from Aruna Roy in India, and really the importance of having a much, you know, a, a much stronger sense of entitlement and laws that actually make these rights available. I'm going to turn uh, to our, our second panelist, uh, Mr. Darren Walker, who's the president of Ford Foundation. Darren, you are very familiar with civic space trends, and especially a lot of the challenges in terms of the decline in democracy across regions. What are the key challenges that you're facing in terms of Ford Foundation's work and support to its partners on the ground? And what can we do better in terms of creating new and innovative forms of international support for uh, grassroots activists and, and, and local civic space actors? It's a great honor to be a part of this panel of distinguished people. I uh, believe firmly that democracy can only flourish where there is a vibrant civil society. And we are seeing the greatest trend of all, inequality, be a support for authoritarian leaders. Indeed, inequality is the oxygen that authoritarian leaders breathe because it allows them to drive wedges. It allows them to divide us. And so we have to address inequality and deconstruct it in all, of our, in all of its forms. As donors, we must be focused on inequality. It is harmful to democracy. There are trends that are troubling. Over 150 countries uh, took, during the time of COVID, uh, restrictions uh, that were uh, supposedly because of public health. Those restrictions uh, are harmful to democracy. So you ask, what can uh, donors do? The first thing donors can do is to collaborate better as donors. Uh, the second thing donors can do is to provide civil society organizations with unrestricted support. We donors often project support our grantees to death. We have to understand that they are most proximate to the challenges and they must be resourced in ways that allow them to prioritize local needs. We also need to fund multi-year. We need to give support over periods of years, not periods of months, because the process of democracy is a contested process and we need institutions to be there consistently over time. And in order for that to happen, they have to be resourced accordingly. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. A very important point in, in terms of really connecting civic space to the broader trends in society, uh, including inequality, but also looking at how it then becomes a much more long-term 
you know, strategic action for some of the, the course corrections that need to happen in the larger political, economic and social structures. And I'd love to get more into that when we open up for discussion. But moving to our next speaker, Isabel, uh, uh, thank you for joining us here. And I'm going to, there's a, there's a strong link between what Darren has said and what, uh, you know, the question that we'd like to raise to you. You're familiar with the status of uh, democracy and civic freedoms in the Americas. We've seen a, a really worrying rise of authoritarianism, of the introduction of regressive laws in the region. What more should be done in terms of the creation of transnational norms and frameworks that can better protect civil society and civic freedoms on the ground? What, what lessons can we take also from the Open Government Partnership platform in this regard? Claro que sí. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much for your question. And it is my pleasure to be part of this panel discussion. Thank you for the invitation. In the Americas, with respect to civil civic space, there has been some illegal control and illegal practices that have been left on their own. And in this regard, we need to provide and protect civic space because this is essential for the basic rights of citizens. Nevertheless, when you look at the trend in the Americas, but our demands have not been recognized and uh, they think the authoritarian governments think that our demands are not legitimate. That's also the case in Mexico. Civil society activities have been attempted and there has been a strong call for civil society participation, but that has been oppressed by the government. Therefore, the civil society is trying to utilize other means, including protests and demonstrations on the streets. And we are also demanding legislation to protect citizens' rights. In particular, we are demanding uh, our citizens' right to know and right to information. For instance, there are major government mega projects and uh, sometimes the government puts more priority on these mega projects over the basic human rights of citizens. This is quite concerning. Furthermore, the government has been utilizing law enforcement agencies to infringe on our freedom and our basic rights. And there has been limited access to information and individual freedom has been violated by the authoritarian government. Therefore, we are asking for more accountability, accountability for government action, but the government has not been responding to us, to our demands. And we understand that public information and open data is very important, but unfortunately, we only have very limited access to public data. So this is quite concerning. Thank you so much. Two really critical points, which I hope we'll get to discuss further in the next segment of this uh, deliberation. One, the, the really the power of protest and mobilization and uh, you know, the, the, the kind of agency we've seen from citizens across the world in terms of galvanizing uh, action and, and demanding better accountability from governments. Uh, but then also then the, the whole issue of, uh, you know, uh, data and technology and surveillance, which also came up in the in the earlier uh, in the in the earlier conversation and, and which we have people uh, and experts in, in the next segment to unpack a little further. I'm going to move on to Mr. Jeffrey Schlagenhoff, and uh, thank you for being here. Uh, OECD has been a visible and vocal champion of civic space, and, and we're particularly interested in the lessons we can learn from two of your initiatives, the Civic Space Scan and the Observatory for Civic Space. Thank you very much. First of all, let me take this opportunity to thank the OGP and the government of Korea for the opportunity to be here today at the OGP Global Summit. 
to renew our, the OECD's commitment to collaborate and celebrate our rich partnership of the past 10 years. Our work on the protection and promotion of civic space is part of an ongoing dialogue among OECD countries on how to reinforce their democracies and their open government agendas. Vibrant civic spaces are an essential precondition for open government initiatives. And there's a critical need to raise protection and promotion standards. You know, uh, just last week, Civicus reported that nine out of 10 people globally live in countries where civic freedoms are se severely curtailed. At the OECD Minister Stereo Council meeting in October, we adopted a new vision for the next decade, underlying our core values of individual freedom, rule of law, the defense of human rights, and democracy. We have also just launched a new OECD initiative on reinforcing democracy that will include a global forum at the end of 2022. One of the pillars of this initiative focuses on creating more effective ways for citizen participation in policymaking that go beyond the ballot box. The OECD Observatory of Civic Space has spent the last year creating a vast baseline of data on the protection of civic space in 50 countries in this context, it's my pleasure to announce that the OECD Open Government Dashboard will go live today. This innovative visualization tool comprises more than 55 indicators on open government, including the promotion and protection of civic space. A link will be shared here in the chat, so please start exploring the data. Finally, I'm happy to report the growing demand from countries to collaborate with us on the protection of civic space. Through our in-depth civic space country scans and work on open government, we're currently advising governments in Finland, Portugal, Romania, Tunisia, Morocco, and Brazil on the protection of civic space. We hope that many more countries will follow. Uh, thanks for your attention and the opportunity to join you today. Thank you so much. And uh, we do have an opportunity to actually delve further into some points that have been raised already. And, and, and a few questions from uh, people who've been listening uh, to this uh, this intervention. But I'm going to start off maybe, Isabel, with you. And, and we were talking about inclusive civil society and inclusive civic space. Uh, you've have had a lot, uh, you know, a lot of work with feminist, uh, you know, the feminist aspects of civic space and dem democracy and, and the protection, particularly of women, uh, in in their role uh, and, and in exercising civic freedoms. Is there something? That we should be thinking more of investing more deeply in, in, in terms of bringing that uh, you know element of women's leadership uh, and agency in, into this conversation. Desde México hemos tenido una. Uh, thank you for the question. In Mexico. We have feminist organizations, several of them, and we have been working to engage these feminist organizations for open government initiatives, especially to promote gender equality, and also in developing and implementing the action plan for open government, we try to keep in mind that gender equality is reflected, for instance, when it comes to the use of weapons to murder women, um, such information uh, has been collected to understand the problems of using weapons for such crimes. So likewise, we are promoting gender equality in all government areas, which is basically about mainstreaming it. Thank you so much. I, I know the OGP platform has a, a really intensive focus on women's leadership in open governance, and, and, and there's the campaign that has, we've run and, and a lot more that we need to do in, in progressing that. So thank you for that input. Darren, I'll, I'll move over to you now. And, and because we've talked about gender equality and you've spoken about systemic inequality, I think one of the challenges really as governments clamp down on resourcing and, and, and the operating environment of civil society is, is really the, the challenges with financing, right? And, and there, there aren't enough models and mechanisms that, that support long-term sustained dom domestic resource mobilization across the world. 
Is there something you can tell us in terms of Ford Foundation's work, but also what other donors and, and supporters of civil society should be doing better in order to really strengthen the leadership of civil society that's led by traditionally excluded communities? Well, first of all, I think, Lisa, the point of uh, making uh, feminism and feminist movements be at the center of uh, civil society is critical. Uh, I believe that donors can do and must do a better job of organizing ourselves to better partner with grassroots organizations and organizations most proximate. Um, we donors often act uh, in silos uh, and have individual relationships uh, with uh, our nonprofit partners. The best thing we can do is help fundraise for them, to help them uh, by uh, creating pooled funds, by uh, partnering with USAID, uh, the British Council, other organizations, uh, whether they be non-state actors or not, who themselves are committed to democracy around the world. Uh, we know that in many regions, um, there is not uh, philanthropy uh, to support uh, those civil society organizations demanding accountability because often the people who are the wealthiest and most powerful and in positions to be philanthropists don't want their power questioned. And so we have to speak as Arun said so beautifully, we have to support those organizations speaking truth to power. Um, and that may get us uncomfortable, but that is a necessary and essential part of philanthropy. Thank you, darling. Mr. Kilney, if I can come to you. Uh, Samantha Power spoke very evocatively about the demor demoralization of civil society. And, and there is a really strong role that governments need to play really in amplifying and recognizing the contributions that civil society make. Uh, can you tell us a little more about, uh, you know, the mechanisms that you've implemented, how the OGP platform has really been able to amplify or, or you know, strengthen that through the, the learning and the solidarity that happens across uh, the network? And of course, I think the fact that we're now celebrating 10 years of, uh, you know, the platform itself uh, with uh, the Republic of Korea hosting it. What does this mean and what inspirations can we take uh, for the journey ahead? Yeah. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, the Moon Jae-in government was born after the candlelight vigil by the citizens because the previous government was oppressive and there was a threat to civil society and people were enlightened and they decided to uh, call for change and reform. And as a result of such civil movement, the current government was established. And since then, there has been growing desire for civil society participation, and the government has been working on creating institutions to ensure uh, such public participation. For instance, po citizens are invited to review budgets, and they're also review, uh, invited to review legislative bills. And in addition, we encourage local government citizen participation so that local residents can address their local problems on their own. As I mentioned previously, public data and opening public data to the public was very crucial because now citizens are able to receive public services more efficiently. For instance, we have the um, electronic public certificates and other documents that people are able to receive immediately. So this has been very effective. In addition, at the COP26, the Korean president made a very ambitious um, greenhouse gas reductions target uh, by reducing uh, more than 40% of the carbon emissions. And in order to achieve this, we have established a carbon neutrality committee and the entire people are committed to this ambitious uh, climate related target. And we were able to do this because uh, there was enough support from the public and such ambitious targets were made possible because there was a discussion with the civil society and their understanding and support. Also, the government has been working to create a basic act 
on civil society development. Uh, this legislative process is underway, and the civil society committee was established, and the government reform forum was established, and the government uh, reform consultative uh, body was established. So these are some of the mechanisms that we have put in place to ensure more civic participation. And we're not only doing it in Korea, but also we'd like to share our experiences with other OJP countries and other OJP local governments so that such initiatives can be spread. And as was mentioned by the previous speakers, our freedom and citizen civic space have been threatened, and we need to work together. And I hope that we will make contributions as the host country. Thank you. Thank you, and, and very heartening to see uh, uh, the government step up and support civic space and civic freedoms so wholeheartedly. Uh, there's obviously a lot of bad news around the world in, in relation to the status of civil society. So every champion counts and, and uh, grateful again for to you for hosting uh, the summit. Uh, Mr. Schlagenhoff, I'm, I'm going to come to you. Um, you mentioned the launch uh, of the Open Government Dashboard, and, and uh, you know we're, we're excited to hear more and, and learn more about how the OGP platform can actually engage much more actively with it and use it uh, towards our shared purpose. Thank you. Yes. Uh... You know, there's been an increasing call for open, from the open government community to have indicators that can measure the impact of open government initiatives on broader policy goals. You know, the OECD, we like to say, pride ourselves in our approach to policymaking, which is evidence-based. And obviously, if you want to manage a problem, address a problem, you need the ability to measure what you're confronting. And so this is our attempt to respond to that call. Um, and obviously we've developed it in coordination with OGP. It's designed to give you a snapshot of the measures that governments are taking to foster openness. Openness is one of the best proxies for a healthy democracy. The dashboard gives you general uh, answers to questions about countries' open government agendas, like what policies guide the agenda, but also specific to civic space dimensions, such as which measures are countries taking to combat online hate speech and harassment, which institutions oversee the implementation of access to information laws. I think in practical terms, the dashboard is a website that comprises indicators on different open government topics. The, the beta version, our present version, includes 55 indicators on the OGP process, citizen participation, transparency, access to information, and of course, the protection of civic space. I think that uh, from our view, for the first time, the dashboard gives the open government and public governance community the possibility to track progress, compare practices, and establish benchmarks on a diverse range of open government topics using data that's been validated by OECD countries. I think most importantly here, I'd like to, as people do take a look at this, emphasize that this is designed to be a living tool. This is something that we'll add more data to over the course of 2022. And we're also really looking for input from people in the civic space, governments, others, and how we can improve it uh, and make it a useful tool in advancing policy objectives. Thank you. It's, it's something we've been looking forward to, certainly, and, and would be very enthusiastic to engage with. I, I'm going to close by, by just throwing a question out and, and would invite uh, any of you who, who have thoughts or inspirations in this regard uh, to respond. Uh, the, the entire framing of the session really is about exploring government and civil society collaboration and partnerships. And, and what we're doing well or where we need to improve. So is, is there any one inspiration or challenge that particularly strikes you, uh, which, which we really need to hold on to and take forward as we think uh, about OGP's future work? So, so maybe I can, uh, Isabel, can I come to you first? Claro que sí. Um... Important. Right. So, as you mentioned, we need to expand civic space. And in order to do that, 
I believe that we need to engage not only the administrative government, but also the legislative uh, body, which is parliament, and also the judicial uh, branch as well. So we need to engage all aspects of the government. And secondly, as was mentioned in the previous session, we need to put more emphasis on what the local governments can do, not just the central government, but the local governments. They need to play a role because when there are restrictions imposed by the central government, now local governments can open up new kinds of civic space where we can find different and new opportunities. So in that sense, I would like to argue that we need to engage more uh, local governments and then we can uh, create more space for our citizens. And finally, I'd like to emphasize the importance of open data and there are various areas where they utilize public data and also there are civil organization groups and we need to build a bridge, a better bridge that connects between these different domains. Thank you, excellent points and inspirations for us to take forward. Darren, can I come to you? Thank you, Lisa. Uh, yes, I think we donors can work better in forming uh, mechanisms for investment in civil society with government. Uh, often we have those relationships with government and we need to uh, really uh, leverage those relationships. I also want to just say, Aliza, that it is easy on any given day uh, to be uh, dejected and depressed about what we're seeing around the world. Um, 331 human rights uh, defenders, uh, civil society leaders were killed uh, in 2020. That's an appalling number, but those lives cannot be lost in vain. Uh, we uh, have to, uh, in their honor, uh, uh, to uh, support um, the work continuing. Um, and so the work of donors must be to support those with courage, those with courage who are willing and prepared to even give their lives. So we have to support that courage with capital with real sustained investment. And uh, just listening to uh, this panel, I am deeply inspired uh, and know that my colleagues at the Ford Foundation uh, just wanna affirm our support for civil society. Thank you so much, Devin. Mr. Kuhn, would you have, like to come in? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so Darren already talked about providing resources and support to civil society organizations. So in my comment, I'd like to mention some specific ways we can engage our citizens. And I think that we need institutionalization and legislation to make sure that citizens are allowed to participate in the public sector decision making process. Currently, in the public policy making process, they may be involved, but they need to be involved in the implementation stage as well, not just a consultation, but also in the process of implementation. And I think we need to open more data. Thank you so much. And, and Mr. Schlegenhoff, I'm going to give you the last word. Uh, thank you very much. I think one thing that's really clear is in this environment, civic space, is really under great pressure. We've seen restrictions on freedom of expression in the media, a shrinkage of freedom of association and targeted repression in some places of civil society. I think that I go back to what I said starting out, our OECD vision statement, which is the need to defend individual liberty, the rule of law and the defense of human rights and in that defend democracy as well. Uh, this, is, this is the real thing. And I think that civil society has a really key role to play here, particularly if citizens insist that their governments be candid and honest and open with them. I think a lot of the issues we see with protests around the world that are rising is people's lack of faith in what their governments are doing to protect their freedoms and their futures. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think uh, in, in the fireside chat, Arunaroy made a comment about solidarity being our best defense. 
against the attacks uh, we face on, on civic freedoms. And, and this panel really brings that together because we've heard from different sections of, of, of you know, civil society and, and supporters of civil society on what we can do better. You'll have highlighted some really key challenges in terms of the purpose and the role of civil society really being long-term transformative change and therefore the operating environment, uh, which includes the laws that support it or, or the resources that go into strengthening civil society's work really need to have a similar kind of strength in terms of its long-term vision and, and, and transformative outcome. And then finally, I think a, a lot of elements in terms of you know, the nuances that we will actually need to unpack in the next segment of, of this discussion, which includes issues of data privacy, how technology is, is either being used against civil society or can be used to strengthen civic action. Uh, and, and also uh, really the, uh, you know, the, the, the crux really being of how we engage civil society and, and communities much more strongly in the design implementation and uh, you know, review uh, of, of different mechanisms that we create. So all of the data we're generating, all of the, the tools we're creating, the laws we're trying to implement, uh, they really need to be powered by the passion and perseverance that we see from grassroots activists on the ground and local civil society across the world. So thank you all very much again uh, for, for this really uh, inspiring and, and very exciting conversation. I think a lo it, it's good to end the year uh, with, with some uh, ideas and inspirations we can take forward, particularly since it's been uh, you know, a year also of, of, of serious challenge uh, you know, in, in this period and across the period of the pandemic. Uh, I look forward to engaging with all, all of the speakers in the next session as, as we you know, delve a little more into those insights and, and try to see what more we can take out in terms of lessons and innovations for the OGP platform. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much to our speakers and our moderator for the discussion. Thousands gathered in Gwanghamun Square in Korea years ago to protest the previous administration. President Moon invited citizens back to the same square to propose policies that responded to their needs. Many proposals have become policies, and one of them came from third graders at Jeju Chungang Elementary School. This is their story. Tega Tishigil Karacho Jurte, Kuza Kusogeman Tunja Don Tishigi, Aidirege Tirogasite, Ton Aidirege, Hunga Munze de So, Kujuni Kurkan Goshi Kengjangi, Chunya Dago Singakan and Deo. Aidiri Iroan Bugo Munze de Iehaji Mutan Dan and Gosin, Kengjangan Uerago Singakamida. 한국에서는 냉동식품에 대한 배송 문화가 매우 활발하게 발달되어 있는데요. 이렇게 배달되어 온 The disposal rice packs that accompany these deliveries often end up underground and end up back in our water supply. So, in order to make a real change, we submitted our idea to the national government. Currently, Gwanghamun uh, government platform is a representative platform with more than 530,000 members in just two years and 10 months. Uh, people of various classes and ages are participating through this online and offline channels. One of the best examples so far was a proposal related to recycling ice packs. This was proposed by third graders at Jeju Chungang Elementary School. Our efforts also resulted in an invitation to the Government Innovation Expo. Our students got a chance to interview the minister 
And when the idea was implemented in real life, we were all moved tremendously. The important thing is that the administration knows what the people really want and listens to the opinions of the people. Yeah. Our next panel will place a spotlight on country action and hope governments and civil society actors face civic space challenges and pushback. The following speakers will join us for this session. Introducing them, Doug Rutson, the Executive Director of the International Center for Not-for-Profit Law and OGP Steering Committee member. Next is Eliza Peter, the Executive Director of Publish What You Pay and OGP Steering Committee member. Adrian Alcala Mendez, Commissioner of the National Institute for Transparency, Access to Information and Personal Data Protection in Mexico. Romy Mom, Honor Honorable Commissioner for Human Rights of the Police Service Commission in Nigeria. Sarah Castell, Chief Executive Officer of INVOLVE and Kwon Woo Hyun, member of the Korean Open Government Forum. And last but not least, Lisa John will be moderating this session. Hello and welcome, you are connected. Thank you for joining us in this uh, second uh, iteration of the discussion we've had earlier uh, in, in terms of really framing the trends, opportunities, and challenges for inclusive civic space and civil society. Uh, I'm, I'm really pleased to have all of you here, and, and, and so we do justice to each of your experiences and insights. Uh, I'm, I'm going to call on you in, in pairs so that we, we really have uh, the ability to kind of exchange uh, a little bit uh, of information uh, based on where you come from and also uh, you know, address some pointed questions which also build on uh, the conversation that we've had earlier. So very happy to invite two of my colleagues from the steering committee uh, of the Open Government Partnership, uh, Doug and Elisa first. Uh, thank you for being here. And Elisa, I was particularly excited when uh, Samantha Power mentioned the examples from the extractive uh, you know, activists uh, dealing with the extractive industry. And, and, and we're looking forward to hear more about what you will say uh, on this uh, issue. But to begin with, Doug, uh, you're, you're someone who is uh, really scanned and, and, and you know, really knows, has, has a lot of knowledge about how civic space is evolving and, and what kind of actions uh, and, and mitigation measures are really evolving as well across the world. And, and ICNL has been doing fantastic work and, and really providing a lot of thought leadership in, in this regard. So um, uh, some of the earlier speakers, you know, pointed to uh, the disproportionate use of emergency powers. I was particularly interested, actually, in the comments that uh, Isabel had made about the attacks on peaceful protesters, for instance. And, and it's interesting to note that, uh, you know, we have around 48 countries in the OGP platform who've made commitments in relation to civic freedoms, but only 5% of those commitments are actually related to the freedom of peaceful assembly. So uh, what can we do uh, better in, in order to really understand the impact of how emergency powers and laws have been used uh, in this period? Um, and then, and what should we do? Be doing more of in, in order to strengthen civil society, especially at the national level, and, and build on some positive examples, maybe of how civic space is being strengthened. Well, thanks, Lisa, and I thank OGP for organizing this session. You're right. Emergency measures spread faster than the virus itself, and some measures were adopted so quickly that legislatures and citizens had no time to analyze them at all. And I understand pandemics pose a fundamental challenge for democracy. There's this need for decisive action, but then we take democratic shortcuts and we don't have participation or oversight. And as a result, many measures undermined open and accountable governance. Some gave the executive branch vast power undermining democratic checks and balances. And others allowed governments to repurpose COVID apps to surveil their citizens. As you mentioned, Lisa, in some countries, governments also used COVID as a pretext 
to ban assemblies by social movements, but curiously, they allowed pro-government rallies to proceed. So in too many countries, pandemic responses have been used to lock down democracy and quarantine civil society. And while many are cast as short-term responses, they cause long-term harm. We have to look no further than 9-11, where emergency powers seeped into the legal framework and became permanent. And we find this to be the case with almost all threats that don't have a natural expiration date, whether terrorism or now a pandemic. So you asked, how do we ensure democratic health while responding to a crisis? I mentioned this last week at the Summit for Democracies, three Ps, one prevention. Let's prevent further harm from emergency measures. In the coming months, governments should engage with legislatures, civil society, and others to review pandemic responses. But let's also review the overall framework for emergency powers. These can be easily misused by authoritarians who come to power or who seek to return to power. Two, promotion of OGP principles. There are plans for a pandemic treaty, a global health threats council, and a $10 billion financing mechanism. Lisa, you know this from COP26 and other international initiatives. We must try to embed participation, transparency, and accountability into the international architecture. Three, preparedness. During the pandemic, nearly 35 parliaments suspended sessions. Over 75 democracies limited court operations. Let's develop emergency preparedness plans so democratic institutions can stay open the next time we have a crisis. So three Ps, prevent harm, promote OGP principles, and prepare for the next emergency. And how do we concretely move that forward? OGP is launching a civic space peer learning network. We know that members across the partnership have valuable experience to share, and we encourage every OGP government to consider joining the network. So just a few ideas to kick off the conversation. Thank you, and, and there'll be time to go back uh, in, into some of the points you've raised. I'm particularly interested actually in uh, what you mentioned about you know, the, the need for parliamentary oversight, but also much stronger mechanisms for civic and democratic oversight. And it would be great to hear more examples of how that's happening and, and where that can be strengthened uh, across the world. But uh, coming to you, Elisa, uh, what what inspirations and examples do you have from your work at uh, Publish What You Pay uh, on, that we can learn from and draw on in terms of how we the pushback against uh, you know regressive governments or the repression of civic space and civil society can be organized? Thanks, Lisa, and uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, with with you all today. So just to start, you know, I wanted to say that Publish What You Pay is not a human rights or civic space organization. We've had to pivot to these issues and we're a part of this conversation today because restrictions to civic space have become one of the main obstacles to achieving our mission, which is to make the oil, gas and mining sector more open and accountable. There are 65 resource rich countries in the world, meaning countries whose um, economies are heavily reliant on the exploitation of natural resources. We work in most of these countries and, and many of them are OGP countries. Yet, according to the latest Civicus Monitor, only three out of those 65 countries have open civic space. So for us at, as, as grassroots activists fighting corruption in those countries, we bear the brunt of that closed uh, space for civic action. Around 40% of the attacks against activists uh, that are tracked by the Business and Human Rights Resource Center globally are linked to the extractive industries. And in particular, one new trend we're seeing is the increasing use of strategic lawsuits against public participation, SLAPs. Today, over a third of those strategic lawsuits in the world are initiated by mining companies against communities, individuals, journalists, or organizations that either oppose mining projects or raise concerns about their negative impacts. So how do we fight back? So Publish Ready Pay is working to both counteract the repression of civic space and to widen the space for meaningful participation. We mobilize when our members are under attack 
to secure their release from prison or to put practical security and support measures in place. We also championed civic space at international forums like the EITI, as mentioned earlier uh, by Samantha Power, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative to ensure that participation is understood in a way that takes into account this broader civic space situation. So on that note, all eyes are on the EITI at the moment for the result of the assessment of the Philippines. This country, as you know, Lisa, was recently downgraded by the Civicus Monitor from obstructed to repressed. And the question is whether the EITI will recognize the chilling effect that attacks have on activists trying to advance um, resource governance. But civic space isn't just about not attacking your critics, it's about listening and responding to them. So while we push back uh, forcefully against the rising attacks, we also push for reforms to ensure meaningful public participation and inclusion. For instance, through the co-creation and implementation of ambitious OGP commitments on these issues. Thanks. Thank you. And because you've mentioned the Philippines, I'm, I'm reminded of the, the very powerful uh, speech that Maria Ressa, the Nobel Prize uh, winner, Peace Prize winner, gave earlier this week. And, and really reinforcing the message that we heard earlier about the role of civil society really being speaking truth to power and and the more repression we face, the more you know we, we need to connect together, collaborate, coordinate, uh, and, and stand up to defend the values that are so important to, to our societies. Uh, but Doug, coming back to you, um, uh, would you like to speak a little more about you know the elements of oversight? I, I mentioned uh, parliamentary oversight and democratic oversight, but I'm also reminded that uh, we had a comment about the importance of local governments uh, in, in the last discussion. So, you know, who are these? allies that we can actually bring together and work together more closely with when we talk about the force that, that, that comes together to defend civic and democratic freedoms? Lisa, it's a nice question. So essentially during a crisis, there's this impulse to centralize power. And I understand it. You want to expand power, you want to centralize power, and you want to act quickly. But what we find is that over time, you need to figure out a way that you can have a more participatory, inclusive, and accountable system. And we found that there are good practices among OGP members. Some, for example, involve civil society in their COVID-19 pandemic response policy committees. So they actually integrated them directly into the response committees. Others have organized what they call lockdown dialogues, and they held hundreds of consultations around the country, engaging with citizens to hear directly What's their experience with the pandemic, with the pandemic responses, and what could the government be doing better? There's also an issue of oversight around sunset provisions, that in some countries they've actually put in provisions saying that the emergency powers will expire after a certain period of time. It goes back to ancient Roman law. The word dictator comes from the time of a crisis in Rome where they would appoint a dictator for six months but the dictator was expected to relinquish power after that time. So we see countries that actually build in sunset provisions, and then they have the legislative branch engage in oversight. So there's lots of good practice out there. I think through the peer learning network, we might be able to share and scale those good practices. Thank you, Doug. And, and Elisa, I think you, you made the really important point of how civic space is actually not uh, something that lives in isolation. It's something that you know underpins and underscores the activism that we see across issues and themes and sectors. So the extractive industry is one, or activists, uh, you know, dealing with the extractive industry is one aspect of it. But it it really makes the case for how the language of civic and democratic freedoms really needs to be embraced much more strongly across sections of civil society, and we need to be doing a much better job of, of breaking the silos uh, in, in terms of the work that we do and, and making a stronger case, especially for uh, the leadership of traditionally excluded communities who are affected by systemic or structural discrimination in championing and, and leading you know, the, 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 the advancement of civic and democratic freedom. So are, are there more examples from the work that you do that we can, we can take away uh, from in terms of making that connection and ensuring that the, the, the discourse on civic space doesn't remain a global technical 
you know, kind of dialogue, but is really something that is brought to life uh, by the actions, by the, the power and the persuasion that we see on the ground. Thanks, Lisa. And yes, for our members who publish what you pay is a global movement of a thousand member organizations, very grassroots groups that um, are trying to make the extractive sector more accountable and more open. So civic space is a lived reality for so many of our members. It's not an abstract notion at all. Uh, it means um, if and how we take risk to speak truth to power. A lot of people have mentioned earlier uh, the importance and the fundamental role of civil society to speak truth to power, to hold a to hold governments and companies accountable uh, to claim their rights. But there's real dangers in doing that. So how can we make sure that we together uh, as civil society actors in the context of OGP protect um, that space and empower those voices to be, to be heard um, by the powers to be? Uh, for me, you know, and, and I think that's for all of us here on this panel today, uh, unless we make um, progress on this fundamental ingredient of open government that is civic space, um, we won't be able to achieve the transformational impact and the full potential of OGP. This is so much at the center of everything that open government is. And just to quote a, a colleague of mine the other day, I was saying, we so oh, publish what you pay is a, at the roots of the movement is a call for transparency. Uh, but transparency can only lead to accountability if there is civic space. So if you will, transparency is like a seed that you plant in the earth and that earth is civic space. And, and if the earth is well tilled and fertile, then that transparency, access to information, disclosure of data will eventually lead to accountability. But uh, if you put that seed of transparency in an unfertile ground in closed space, it will never lead to transform transformative governments in the extractive sector or beyond. Thanks. Thank you so much. And, and that actually provides uh, you know, the perfect opportunity to shift uh, to the next pair of speakers. And I'm, I'm particularly excited about this uh, interaction because we have not one, but two commissioners from, from two different countries uh, together, and, and, and we're looking forward to really understand both the challenges and the opportunities of the experiences you've had in leveraging the OGP platform to, to really push forward and, and make practical the idea of government and civil society partnership and collaboration. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm going to come first to you. Uh, Adrian, and, and thank you for joining us here. You've, you've got an extensive uh, you know, background and experience in understanding uh, violations to data privacy and understanding uh, you know, issues of access to information and, and, uh, and, and privacy. And uh, in, more recently, in, in the period of the pa pandemic, the Pegasus scandal has really been something that shocked all of us. Uh, and, and you've been, uh, you know, part of the res of framing a response to how we can deal with uh, the issues that it exposed better. Uh, the the uh, National Institute has actually been uh, involved in, in developing an OGP commitment on democratic controls to state surveillance. Can you help us unpack what that means? It's a lot of big words and, and then be, we're really looking forward to see how uh, you know the OGP community can learn better about uh, the the how we address the challenges of technology and surveillance better through the collaboration of of civil society and government. Claro, gracias, Lisa. Muy buenos días. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Chair and moderator. It is morning right now in Mexico, and it is, I understand, it's uh, late at night in the Republic of Korea. As has been mentioned by one of my other colleagues, Isabel, in the other panel discussion, one of the issues right now in Mexico is the Pegasus scandal. In fact, about 17 research institutes participated in this, and the New York Times was also involved where the software was used in this particular uh, case. And 
It was used for personal individual surveillance that we were able to see that different pieces of software were being manipulated and used illicitly to try to engage in individual surveillance, which is why uh, that this government was trying to engage in illicit surveillance of individuals, private individuals, and that was the uh, thrust of the scandal. So that is why we feel that this was a huge threat to procurement and in surveillance. And when the in open government partnership, I believe in 2013 or so, dealt with this issue regarding in, in legal surveillance and surveillance regarding means of technology. And I believe uh, that we had discussed a theme at the time, and I remember that there were working groups set up to discuss this topic, and there were some people who said that they will no longer participate in this working groups. There is a Mexican organization called INAI, and this INAI organization has been working in three-party consultations with the government to try to ask for a crackdown on all illegal surveillance. Therefore, regarding the different capacities of the different uh, stakeholders involved, we try to engage in exchange to try to see what each of us can bring to the table regarding our own competencies. And we also try to work together to try to solve this issue. Since 2017, in order to solve many different illicit surveillance means, we have continued to engage in a series of discussions, and one of them was to enhance transparency. When we say enhancing transparency, this is something that international organizations can obviously engage in, but the federal government of Mexico can also work very hard on, because enhancing transparency is really at the heart of all illegal activities, especially with illegal surveillance. It's a very strong tool to ward against this kind of surveillance activities. INAI, the organization that I mentioned before, have worked together with relevant organizations to try to enhance transparency in Mexico. And this was the countermeasure to Pegasus scandal that I mentioned before. And INAI at the time have as the audit service, the National Audit Service, to reveal to us, to give us access to information regarding all government to procurement contracts, especially those information related to the Pegasus scandal. So we asked the National Audit Board, the National Audit Service, to provide us with this kind of information to try to see whether the National Audit Service did its job properly. Thank you. That's that's extremely uh, useful, and I'm, I'm going to come back to you with a question after uh, when, when we open up for discussion, really on the role of business and and how uh, you know we're we're able to strengthen our ability to regulate their intervention in uh, illegal service surveillance, like you've mentioned, and and you 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 talked about the tripartite uh, you know partnership, and and we've talked a lot about you know the government and civil society collaboration, but uh, it, it would be great to understand more. Uh, about how business is both a partner, but also, uh, you know, uh, a recipient of the oversight and accountability that we're 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 talking about. Uh, but coming to you, Commissioner Romi, thank you for joining us. Uh, you've been in the very difficult position of framing uh, an an actual instance of, uh, you know, engagement and dialogue in in a very difficult uh, situation. Uh, the issue of police brutality and the need for stronger oversight over law enforcement agencies has really uh, you know made headlines across the world and and you've been in the position where uh, you know in the aftermath of the uh, NSARS protest uh, you've you've used the UOGP forum and platform to to build a, a level of dialogue between civil society and government there've been certain com commitments that have been made as part of the OGP forum to help strengthen police accountability and the support uh, that they can provide to civic, the exercise of civic freedoms and particularly in the context of protests. So we're very keen to hear about your uh, own experience, but also the challenges and, and kind of uh, inspirations we should be taking forward, particularly in the implementation of some of these commitments. And, and we know that it's been a difficult path. There've been, there's been an intention, but you know, there's a lot more that needs to be done in terms of really getting different stakeholders together 
and, and ensuring that the implementation happens in the spirit in which the commitment was uh, created. So over to you. Thank you very much, Lisa. And um, like you rightly noted, um, when these things happen, uh, the protests and uh, brutality and all of that, the important thing is how citizens and government come together to find paths towards um, uh, a better situation going forward. And the case of Nigeria is no different. Uh, post the NSAS protest, which um, was as a result of police brutality and all of that, uh, there, there was a need to sit down and, 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 and government and, and, sit, and, and citizens to try to find a way forward in terms of uh, a brighter future with more accountability, expand the civic space and all of that towards neutralizing uh, the, or reducing the possibility of such happening. And the OGP was a very good platform to, to further this. So citizens and government came together, co-created some activities under Commitment 13, which specifically deals with the issue of, uh, of the civic space. And some of the activities uh, are, are, are very germane. Like for example, the first is to see how the oversight body can be strengthened to really go in there and demand accountability, transparency, and all of that in the civic space when it comes to police and all of that. Now, this is very necessary because when uh, the civic space is tightened or when persons suffer uh, violations of their rights and all of that, and accountability is not key, it's a motivation for more of that to happen. And so uh, a legislation was proposed uh, to the National Assembly, which is the parliament, in trying to see how the Police Service Commission, which is the oversight body of the police, uh, uh, will be strengthened in terms of uh, trying to expand its geographic location, not just in the federal city, in the federal capital city, but all across the country, the regions and the grassroots where this brutality most often happen, how the Police Service Commission can be equipped, how it can be funded and all of that. So as to effectively address this. Um, before now, the, 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 it, it was an appearance of an accountability body, but in terms of uh, uh, the presence and the issues where we, we co-created the activities towards addressing, it fell well below the mark. It is interesting to know that this is now on. Parliament uh, has, is working on the, on, on the law, as I said. The bill has passed the second reading, and we are hoping that sooner than later, that will be passed and we begin to look at implementation. Uh, key also is the fact that um, another activity like the visitation to police stations uh, by the National, by, by the Police Service Commission and CS, CSOs, you know, go together, go into detention centers, police stations, and look at how citizens' rights even in detention are being respected and, and, and see how the police on a day-to-day -day carry out its activities. So there are, for example, civil society decks at police stations, detention centers, and all of that to monitor who comes in and who goes and for what reason, so that we can have some sort of, sort of data to not only feed into possible review and policies, but also actions and interventions that are tailored and strategic, pinpointed to, 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 to this action. Another very interesting uh, thing that, that, that came out from uh, the, the citizens and government sitting together in trying to you know, address this issue in some form of co-creation is the fact that the National Human Rights Commission, which is the ombudsman, uh, the, 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 the body in Nigeria, alongside the Police Service Commission, and very importantly, citizens groups will hold quarterly dialogues to speak to the issues. You know, these issues are dynamic. What is going on? How do we go about it? And, and, and all of that. One of the issues that came out from the NSAS protest was the utter lack of communication, you know, platforms or mechanisms. You know, communication is not just about throwing out information there, it's about feedback mechanism. 
where you speak and hear each other and together come to uh, 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 a, a situation and a, and a platform where you can look at uh, uh, going forward, how to address these matters. So now you have the National Human Rights Commission, the Police Service Commission and citizens groups holding quarterly dialogues and trying to speak through the issues because one of the biggest challenge that was there before was the fact that trust is completely, so to speak, you know, uh, not there is eroded owing to the past experiences between uh, the, the police and citizens. And so these quarterly uh, dialogues are helping to not just instill trust, but also open up channels of communication so that where trust is lacking, the issues can be addressed. So like I started by saying, uh, uh, the, 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 the protests that came into the country as a result of the tightening of the speak space, police brutality and all of that has incidentally has bet some actions that hopefully will resolve the situations and going forward, uh, if implementation comes and implementation is on the table, then we will, uh, we will say that for, for truth, we are making progress. But again, let me note this issue. Implementation is key. So we're not just talking about the, the frameworks or the policies and the laws, but implementation. I think I'll stop here. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and, and we're very grateful, of course, for your leadership in, in trying to find a way to establish that trust and dialogue in a very difficult time. The NSAS protest, I mean, it, it's we've marked a year since uh, that happened earlier, and it was a, a really key and triggering moment, not just for civil society in Nigeria, but for civil society across the world, and especially civil society on this continent. So uh, I think uh, we, we, we really uh, do see that, you know, the, the opportunity for leadership that comes from individuals like yourself, but also from institutions like the oversight bodies you've mentioned is, is so key. And, and if we have time for a follow-up question, I, I'd love to hear more about how we can do more to strengthen our relationship with such oversight bodies as the National Human Rights Commission or the Police Service Commission, because that tends to be an afterthought in a lot of the work that we do on open governance and, and civic freedoms. And maybe we should be investing more energy uh, in building those relationships. Uh, but uh, Adrian, coming back to you, uh, is there something you can tell us about how we could better monitor and engage uh, businesses or the private sector in, in, their in the role that they play in relation to illegal surveillance? Thank you very much. Uh, lastly, I would like to provide some closing remarks to my comments. In Mexico, regarding OGP, the civil society participated in the procurement of security software programs. We engage in open dialogue and interactions with one another in terms of procuring the right to security software programs. And in that process, we're able to see how a dialogue between the public sector and the civil society was really instrumental in trying to bring about improvements in the internal decision making process. And I think that this had an impact on improving accountability and, of course, uh, transparency. INAI, the National Transparency Research Institute, takes this very seriously. And going forward, we will continue to try to achieve the ideology behind OGP and continue to work on building on its values. We will continue to try to enhance access to the government, uh, protect personal data, and make sure that this is done in a constitutional way. Make sure that more people can have access to information and going forward, we'll continue to work on these issues. Furthermore, this morning, if you look at what the president has said, I think that goes back to his remarks on November 19th, where he said that for all uh, public infrastructure related projects that our country is going to work on improving transparency. In that process, if there is a problem, then 
we at INAI, our research institution, can bring a complaint all the way up to the constitutional courts. And this kind of complaint mechanism will be built into the system so that the citizens can have access to important and necessary information. By doing so, we can empower more citizens. And to do so, we can engage in more trust building and that will ultimately be brought by dialogue. And this is something that has to be done in a horizontal manner, not in any vertical fashion where we will all be on equal footing. And this is something that I wanted to emphasize that citizen participation and citizens' rights will be further promoted through this kind of efforts, especially right now in a situation where democracy is very much under threat that we have to engage in these kinds of efforts. Furthermore, the citizens must participate and work on this together and also work on creative uh, problem solving. Thank you. Thank you and, and, and congratulations for the ex excellent work that INAI is doing. Uh, we continue to draw on uh, many of your insights and lessons and I know there's a further struggle uh, even in the context of Mexico to, to defend access to information uh, you know, and the right to uh, data privacy. So uh, as the OGP community, we really look forward to weighing in on, on the work that you do and supporting your efforts. So uh, Commissioner Romy, I'm going to hand it over to you for a, a, a few closing remarks uh, in, in this section of the discussion, and then we'll move on to the next pair of speakers. Yeah, thank you so much, Lisa. I, I, I just want to say one thing about um, when we talk about laws, policies, and all of that, I go back to the issue of implementation. Uh, I, I, it would be wonderful, for example, if we, in terms of co-creating and in the spirit of the OGP, working together in governance and all of that, also begin to work with oversight agencies of laws and all of that in terms of implementation. How do we come together as society groups and government to implement and see to the activation of laws that are meant, whether in oversighting of agencies or whether in implementation, implementation towards certain goals and aspirations for the people. And I think this is where most of the times we have gaps in terms of the fact that we come together to co-create things, to say we've done this together, we've done this together, and then we leave it at that. But the issue is, especially in the African continent and most parts of the world, it's about how to activate and implement these laws. That's, what's, that's what is critical. And I think we should move the issue of working together, building together, to implementation together, to implementing together. You know, so for, for me, that is key. How do we begin to bring the, bring the issue of co-creation into also co-implementation? That for me is, a, is, 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 is food for thought and I'd want maybe going forward for us to think through that carefully in the years ahead as we, you know, bring government and citizens to work together in government. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you both of you for some very important challenges and insights. And, and, and luckily the next two speakers we have in this discussion are the experts on implementation and, and co-creation. So we're, we're closing off really nicely on this discussion and I'm very pleased to have both of you here, Sarah Castell and uh, Kuan Oyon. Am I saying your name uh, correctly? Uh, and both of you come with immense experience on really making uh, you know, public participation and inclusive uh, democracy practical and, and and both from the point of view of citizens assembly Sarah you're you're quite uh, you know you, you're you're kind of you have a lot of experience and leadership in that uh, and Kohan uh, you you're coming in with the whole idea of how technology can actually help uh, increase uh, citizen engagement and, and ensure that you know our, our, our governments and our democracies are much stronger because of the participation that communities uh, bring uh, in fact, I have a comment from uh, Lisa Peter, who, who was one of our earlier panelists, uh, really uh, talking about how this also links in with the whole issue of energy transition and, and climate justice and, and the leadership then of the most affected communities, which are usually, uh, you know, the last or the, or the least heard in, in a lot of decision making processes has to be key and, and we will really not achieve the kind of open governance uh, reforms that we aspire to if we can't bring that leadership and make it central to all of our decision-making uh, processes. So Sarah, coming first to you, uh, what, what advice do you have 
uh, for the OGP community in relation to developing and, and uh, you know, kind of really unleashing the power of citizen assemblies uh, in, in, in all parts of the world that we work? And, and what are those key elements or values or principles that we really need to, to, to take away with us when we're looking at forms of co-creation and participation? Thank you, Lisa, and hello, everybody. Um, so Involve is the UK's public participation charity. So as Lisa said, this is what we do all the time. We work for a more robust, more innovative democracy, and we try and put into practice uh, some of those democratic uh, interventions and innovations that, uh, that, will, that will help us get there. Um, and so we do a lot of work around citizens' juries, citizens' assemblies, and uh, I think it's very exciting that uh, it's becoming more recognised the role that they're playing in, in bolstering civic space and in creating very practical, constructive ways to link uh, reformers in government with civil society and with the communities, um, as Elisa's comments shows, you know, with the communities that are particularly affected by um, by by change, by transition, and by uh, by the move to a sort of hopefully more equitable society. Um, so we heard Jeffrey speaking earlier about the inspiring new civic space observatory, and the OECD has also released uh, an amazing report, catching the deliberative wave last year, and that really shows, I think, how those deliberate processes like citizens, juries and assemblies um, have seen such rapid growth um, and also helps us think about how that they can they can counter the polarization which is shrinking our civic space. Um, again, thinking back to earlier, uh, Ambassador Powers said, you know, we really need to scaffold and support government reformers from within. Um, and I think citizens' assemblies particularly have a number of, of built-in features that help us do that. Um, and if we if we do them right, uh, they can demonstrate that citizens work together on issues that are divisive. So rather than having more polarization, more adversarial uh, communications, um, we can bring people together. Um, and and the, the evidence is that when you bring people together, they tend to have um, a much more kind of a much more common ground than perhaps they would have in different circumstances. So citizens assemblies focusing on them particularly, um, they have uh, relatively small numbers of citizens who collectively reflect the wider demography of their society. And of course, that's not the only way that you can bring citizens together, because sometimes, of course, you have to overemphasize marginalized voices and you have to overrepresent groups who are particularly affected. But it is pretty powerful to have a reflective group of people um, from you know, a microcosm of society deliberating for quite a long time usually two days, often substantially longer, six, eight, ten days of, of, of deliberation, um, and bringing in that expertise and evidence um, from so many different sources, that's critical as well to an effective deliberative process. Um, focusing on complex, controversial policy questions um, and helping us, I guess, think about not just, you know, what, what pieces of information we bring to bear, but on how the whole information environment around a debate is structured. Um, you know, the, the stories that government would like to tell, the stories that civil society would like to tell, the stories that corporate interests would like to tell as well about you know, what world we want to live in, what kind of policies and practices we want to have, how, uh, and, and the Citizens' Assembly process, I think, shows us how to link the lived experience of people with uh, expertise and, and policy and practice. Um, I mean, I, I think Citizens' Assemblies work very well when they're focused on the future as well, because that enables us to, uh, to think about the conditions that would make the future better for democracy. Um, there's a very interesting Citizens' Assembly happening at the moment, the Conference on the Future of Europe in the EU, um, and that the recommendations are being published sort of as we, as we watch. And things like media pluralism, protecting media pluralism is coming out as a recommendation. So that's not just about, you know, a, the specific governance of Europe, but it's, a, it's about the conditions which will create stronger democracy. Um, so I th Thank you. Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, sorry, I didn't want you to finish. In fact, Sarah, uh, the issues you're talking about are very close to my heart, and I have a more difficult question for you as a result. Uh, you know, uh, Aruna Roy spoke to us at the beginning of this uh, closing plenary, and, and one of the, the things that, uh, one of the many things that uh, MKSS has done to really inspire the rest of the world is the Janssen Vise, and therefore the, the, the concept of, you know, civic assemblies or citizen assemblies and, and the, the, the fact that you need more 
you know, scaled up mechanisms for communities that are generally not heard to be heard in decision making is something that's really gripped the imagination of civil society across the world. Uh, we, we celebrated the 75th year of the UN uh, last year, and one of the key ideas that has come out of there is the idea of a World Citizens Initiative, which is really taking the idea of the Citizen Assembly and, 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 and seeing how it works at a global scale. So when we come back, I, I'd really like to get to your thoughts on how we can make this something that's also uh, you know, non-negotiable for international or multilateral uh, institutions and, and, and where we can then use you know, the energy that the OGP community brings to, to really connect the local and the global, uh, you know, engagement on, on citizen assemblies. But I'll give you a few moments to think about that while we move to uh, Kuan. And uh, Kuan, there's been a lot of discussion about surveillance, about, uh, you know, kind of illegal forms of uh, violations on data privacy. Uh, but you're kind of the ray of hope that also has been talking about how technology can be uh, used to accelerate civic freedoms and citizen participation. So, so what inspirations do you have for us in this regard? And, and then where can we then really strike the balance between the negative role that you know we've seen technology playing, especially in, in relation to human rights defenders, uh, and, and then and, and really amplify much more of the positive and, and empowering role that it can and should play uh, in defending civic and democratic freedoms? Then, one, so I get First of all, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity. I'm very happy to be able to listen to all these uh, wonderful activists. And let me explain the situation in Korea. Uh, with the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, there have been many citizens who were willing to use technology for the benefit of the entire society. And uh, as for me, I am working for an organization called Code for Korea. And when this mask shortage problem happened, we made a proposal, a policy proposal to the Kwang Ha Moon platform, to the government, and we created an application, a smartphone application. And it took only five days for us to develop this application by getting access to public data. And we have so far um, seen that more than 150 people participated, including middle school students. So this process was a rather an extraordinary experience. It was as if all these citizens were celebrating in a festiv festivity in creating this smartphone application for masks during this COVID-19 pandemic. And the citizens were very happy and they felt rewarded that they got to work with the government and they got to make contribution to entire society. And they felt that they had the sense of citizenship and even middle school students were able to have this experience. And so uh, now hundreds of these people could see that many people are using the smartphone application to purchase masks. And they now feel very rewarded because what they did was uh, very helpful for citizens' welfare. Now in Korea, we not only have um, smartphone applications for COVID-19 situation, but also uh, there's a growing awareness that it is not just up to the government to deal with social issues and environmental issues such as climate crisis, because there are a lot of things that citizens can do so many individual citizens would see if there's any public data that they, they can utilize for um, useful application. And I think there are a lot of policy proposals submitted by ordinary citizens. And so this has been a very positive change. Now citizens believe that they can make positive contribution and they think that they can talk to the government, they can work with the government, and also they can utilize this public participation platform that has been provided by the government and public data, which has been, been made available, uh, has been utilized. And I think this is a very important learning experience for all these citizens in Korea. Thank you so much, Kuan. I'm, I'm, I'm very aware it's past 10 p.m. for you, and, and, and thank you for staying on and, and, and still bringing all of your energy and uh, ideas to this, this uh, forum. Uh, you, you talked about you know, the engagement of students, and, and, and maybe that's the question I'd like to bring back to you after we've spoken to Sarah, uh, really, because it is young people, and particularly not just youth, but also you know, people, young people below the age of 18 who are children who are driving 
a lot of the energy we're seeing for democratic uh, you know uh, struggles and and struggles for civic freedoms but also much larger social justice and climate justice transformations across the world so the 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 one of the opportunities we have through the use of technology is really to engage the next generation of civic leaders and and it would be great to hear from you when we close out uh, you know to, uh, what more we should be doing particularly as the ogp community i'm i'm very aware that we we seem to be a community of uh, citizens who are uh, leading towards the senior side of of the age group uh, what more we can do to really engage uh, you know this this new generation of activists this new generation of citizens this new generation of community leaders that really will uh, be the ones to power the future struggles uh, for civic uh, and democratic freedoms that's ela coming back to you i'm i'm, I'm looking forward to what you have to say in terms of scaling up and amplifying uh, the the use of citizen assemblies yeah absolutely i want to talk about young people as well because i think it's the same there's there's uh, there's there's useful useful parallels um I, I, yeah i'm very interested in how we connect the local and the global and i know in just on the uk basis we're seeing in in the net zero space in the climate space um very very hyper local uh deliberative uh, processes which are linking together the, the big principles around how we reach net zero with what's this actually going to mean in, in a very local setting and I think there's lots of tools like participatory budgeting and those kind of very practical tools that you can bring into the processes that, 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 that make them relevant for you know to taking the big picture down to the down to the local level so I think we're going to see a lot more of that and also then that means you can draw in the power of, of, of local government and of, and of local activism uh, to make change that people can actually see in their everyday lives um, and then i think there's there is absolutely potential then to use technology um, as we've just been hearing to scale that up to an app to an absolute global level um, and to use uh you know all sorts of processes i think that haven't even been been developed yet to to, to, to bring together different people i mean we are seeing uh global level citizens assemblies on issues like the for cop 26 or on, on things like genomics which are going to affect everyone in the world and there are challenges around different different places with different kind of government governance regimes and the way that recommendations can actually be taken forward in any global globally meaningful way but i think if you could have a globally meaningful discussion and then a locally relevant implementation discussion that should be a very exciting way of, of using these techniques to um to build a kind of credible global activist platform if you like thank you and you mentioned all sorts of processes that need to be developed to strengthen participation so when you form a group uh, to think that through please include me because that's <laughs> that's where where i i really uh, I, i think uh, I'm, i'm most excited and and that's the journey that civicus also will be taking in terms of really strengthening public uh participation with civic and democratic freedoms so uh, kuan coming back to you uh, any last words for us i mean it's it's always challenging to be the last speakers in a panel because uh, you you have the worst side of the time crunch uh, but i think both of you have done such a fantastic job of ending this discussion on a very high and optimistic and forward looking note so last words to you and then i'll hand back to the mc 네, 청년 문제나 Uh, thank you for this opportunity. I'd like to talk about the role of the youth and the younger generation going forward. Uh, Korea has announced a net zero target, and um, I was actually involved in the carbon neutrality committee. And uh, there was a, another scenario proposed by the youth that was included in our discussion. I believe that we need to listen to the voices of the, the younger generation, and I think we need to give them more opportunities, and that's what the, the older generation has to do. And um, as I've been working in the area of public data for 10 years, and I think things have changed over these 10 years. And now younger people, they are very good at designing, they're very good at developing programs, and they're very um, successful and familiar with technology. And next year uh, and tomorrow, there will be the Youth Summit that is a specially organized session for the Global Summit this year. As I've been working as a civic hacker, I often meet with middle school and high school students. And this entire process of engaging them, I feel younger when I work with these teenagers and I see their enthusiasm and passion. And uh, we it's not just a matter of uh, helping these young people, but rather 
getting their help in achieving what we need to achieve. And, and gradually, there will be a natural transition of leadership from our generation to the next generation. So in that sense, I think it is wonderful that we get to work with the younger people, and it is very exciting. And in this process, there will be a natural transition of leadership from our generation to the next generation. And also, there's a lot that we can learn from the young people. So I think that will be the approach that we need. Thank you so much, uh, Kuan. I've never heard the term civic hacker being used before, but I'm going to try my best to ensure it's on my visiting card by next year. <laughs> so thank you very much for, for this really uh, you know, uplifting end to this uh, discussion. Uh, thanks to all of our speakers. It's, it's been a, a long but very enriching conversation. And of course, a special thanks to our colleagues from the OGP support unit for really bringing this together in such an excellent way. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand back to the MC. Yes, I would like to thank you once again and everyone here tonight. We are grateful to our moderator, Lisa John, and to our speakers who have generously shared their time and insights during this event. Thank you to our attendees as well who have listened and participated during the discussion. The 2021, the 2021 OGP Global Summit has prepared a great lineup of activities for the next few days. For more information, please visit our summit website at www.ogpsummit.org and click on the interactive agenda. And we look forward to seeing you in other thematic fleeneries, regional breakout sessions, and community dialogues. Okay, before we... Uh, Bring the event to a close, I would like to introduce Mark Malak Brown, who will be delivering his closing address, the president of the Open Society Foundations, which is the world's largest private funder of independent groups working for justice, dem democratic governance, and human rights, also working closely with partners to defend against global authoritarianism. So here is his closing remarks. Well, well thank, thank you, and many thanks to the OGP Secretariat and Jennifer Clyde, and to the government of Korea, uh, and to the many US government officials, notably Samantha Power and others who participated in these discussions and, and championed these issues. And, and, and let me just first say it really is commendable and fantastic that Korea is, has, has chosen to prioritize safeguarding civic space as a real theme or a priority theme of the summit this year. It's not without political will and courage to do this because 68% of the world, according to Freedom House, now live in autocracies of some kind where civic space is not respected. Uh, we have to recognize that we are becoming a minority in the world today, those of us who champion the values of democracy. And I think it's right, therefore, that the OGP, which in a way began its mission by looking at the uh, mechanics of government, uh, now looks more widely to the mission of government itself. Uh, government is not about efficiency and transparency or even about elections alone. It is about full citizen participation, that the voice of citizens is heard, respected and responded to by government. And, you know, I think we're aware that even where there is a full democracy, for example, you know, in the last year or so, we've seen the demonstrations of young people, often not old enough for the vote, but deeply frustrated that their voices on climate change are not being heard uh, by their elders. So, you know, there is a flaw in all our eyes, uh, democracies or not, in terms of uh, the kind of governments we have uh, that listen properly uh, to uh, the views of their citizens. And, 
you know, I, I think there are patterns emerging which may be particularly acute in the authoritarian uh, end of the spectrum, but are not missing, I'm sorry to say, uh, at the more democratic end of a undermining and constraining of media, of a limiting of expression and dissent, of vilifying and undermining people's movements and civil society, uh, labeling them terrorists or anti-national. Uh, particularly during COVID, we've seen the sweeping enactment of emergency powers and the expansion of surveillance, the rise of the surveillance state in so many parts of the world and the attacks particularly acutely for an organization like ourselves, a global funder of human rights and democracy on independent funding. Uh, so, you know, turning to the immediate COVID issue, we've seen a hundred countries plus that have uh, declared states of emergency and many with no clear end date. Um, and 58 of those have had measures that have affected freedom of expression, um, freedom of assembly, uh, and measures affecting the right to privacy. Um, so the threats to freedom are pervasive, both uh, created by uh, events now uh, around COVID, but COVID in a sense serving as an accelerator or an excuse uh, for longer term, uh, more damaging uh, trends in our society. So that we see that 40 countries have now adopted new far reaching surveillance powers or new tracking systems and tracing systems, some perfectly legitimately uh, in the pursuit of public health security, but others allowing the systems to go much further and intrude you know, in the privacy and, and data protection protection rights you know, of, of their citizens. So what you have been discussing today and what this summit needs to advance, you know, is putting civic space atop the agenda of the summit. Uh, we welcome the, the launch of an OGB civic space learning network. And I think already in the discussion I've just been privileged to listen to, you know, we're hearing uh, many of the approaches that can be taken uh, to address uh, this. And, you know, we, we, we heard um, that the US announced a 1.5 million increase in its annual contribution to the Lifeline Fund for embattled civil society organizations during the just completed uh, Summit for Democracies. And we are supporters of that too, because it seems to us that we have to help human rights defenders. It's, if you like, a defensive strategy, but only if human rights defenders have some assurance of some support when life is difficult and when they are uh, face the threat of persecution, uh, only then can we give them the license and the, uh, if you like, courage to really step up and step forward to defend societies, uh, to, to spend, defend open space in their societies. So, you know, we would appeal to other governments and other organizations to join us in at Lifeline uh, and to give us human rights defenders uh, the support they need. So in conclusion, at this moment, when the world is still struggling to emerge from the COVID pandemic, when half the world is vaccinated and half is not, producing a huge damaging inequity, a source of disgruntlement, despair, betrayal, uh, which could affect our politics for years to come. Uh, we need the open government partnership to push big and bold ideas for member countries to adopt. And uh, once leaders begin responding to the true scale and scope of the crisis of COVID and economic recovery that we face today with ideas that match the moment in scale and ambition. And to do that, they need to hear the voices of their citizens and not just their own citizens, but the citizens of developing countries. Their voice needs to be heard in donor capitals as well, because we need not national democracy, but we need a global democracy where there is justice and equity, because while democracy may begin at home, it is in its global expression that we really build, build a just society, a global society, which respects all our rights for the future. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much for the inspirational closing address, Mr. Malak Brown, and to the Open Society Foundations for the very valuable work they do to strengthen civic space and support civil society. I would like to remind you once again that this brings us to an end to today's event, but please look forward to uh, other thematic plenaries, regional break breakout sessions, and community dialogues. We will close the opening plenary for the 2021 OGP Global Summit with a video. Thank you, everyone. Sai Philippines' vision is a world where citizens are active partners in improving good governance. The Citizen Participatory Audit is the Commission on Audit's response to its vision and to the call for open government, where citizens participate in enhancing good governance. It is a mechanism of constructive engagement between citizens and government in conducting public audits and capacity building activities to uphold the people's primordial right to a clean government and the prudent utilization of public resources. The citizen participatory audit is founded on the premise that public accountability can prosper only with a vigilant and involved citizenry. Among the many citizen participatory audit engagements are the multi-billion peso Kamanava flood control project, which involved 13 flood control structures meant to mitigate flooding in northern Metro Manila. The disaster risk reduction and management funds and the local government unit's performance in their response to natural calamities and man-made disasters. Farm-to-market roads where compliance with specifications and the selection of locations were validated through a geotagging tool. Solid waste management program where the implementation of proper waste segregation and disposal was validated, including the level of satisfaction of residents on the overall cleanliness of their communities. The CPA is meant to change people's mindset. We would like our people, especially the younger generation, to be involved in the work of governance. Citizens are included in the audit team to make government more effective, transparent, and accountable. After all, democracy is not only for the people, it is also by the people. Mahirap siya. Kasi we all know, well, we have a saying, without no pain, no gain. Mahirap siya, pero at the same time, it is very fulfilling. And I encourage ko yung ibang mga members din ng mga CSOs to open themselves up at alisin yung anumang level of cynicism at uh, sumama at makipag-partner nang sa gayon ay uh, they would know for themselves na yung sinasabi namin na bagamat mahirap sa umpisa ay naging napaka-produktibo at mainam sa kahuli-hulihang bahagi ng uh, proyekto na naranasan namin nung kami ay sumama at nakipag-partner sa COVA. What is uh, nice there? nakita namin yung actual na mga uh, gravel road, mga gravel road yun. Nilakad namin yun, nakita namin kung anong kalagayan ng mga karsada yun. Natutuwa ako kasi uh, unang-una ginamit namin doon yung roller, no? na mechanical na trabaho, tulak ka ng tulak. O, nilakad namin yung uh, 5 kilometer and an 11 kilometer. Na nilakad talaga namin actually, mm -hmm. no? Uh, there is joy in doing it. We continue to leverage the audit techniques and latest technology that we share with our community auditors. We pledge to engage more civil society organizations as we vow to continue to cultivate this journey towards a constructive partnership among citizens and government auditors for a more transparent, resilient, accountable, and open government because this is the heart of CPA.